company you're joining us with. We'd love to know your or your role instead of your company or frankly, all of the above. But, uh, you know, are you in sales? Are you in IT? Are you a C-level executive? Are you a business owner, an entrepreneur? Um, what's your context? And love to know even more specifically, what brings you here today? What is it about the notion of authenticity that really makes the it worth you taking your lunch hour or breakfast hour or midnight snack hour, depending on what time zone on the planet you're joining us from? But what brings you here today? And the more that you uh, share with us, the better, because then it gives us a chance to understand your interests, your needs, and we can adjust our content accordingly. Because you know this isn't a, a formal interview per se. This is a conversation. We're joining you to have a conversation with us and to share. Right? The, the more we all put our collective brains together, experiences, emotions, challenges, et cetera, the more we elevate each other and make the world a better place, which I know sounds a little uh, fortune cookie aspirational, but you know what? I'm sticking with it because that's my mission, one conversation at a time. And I know it is yours too, Dr. James. <laughs> I do. I ditto with saying ditto. I co-sign that. Love it. Okay. So tell us, let's talk a little bit about authenticity because our topic today, the whole more formal title that we've shared is the notion of the authenticity myth, separating fact from fiction. And it, it's so important for everyone in this crazy multi everything, right? Multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-gender, multi-generational world to feel like we can connect with a wider and wider expanding circle of, of influence range of people. But knowing that not everybody speaks the same language, literally or figuratively or otherwise, how do we get through? How do we do my three C's, the ability to command the room, connect with the audience and close the deal when we don't necessarily all speak the same language, literally or figuratively? How do we get through to them while still being true to ourselves? and not feeling like we're faking it or otherwise just running into brick walls right and left. So um, tell me a little bit first, give everybody, Dr. James, a sense of who you are. What's your elevator pitch? <laughs> I help people get out of their own way. Oftentimes we let self-created barriers relative to leadership, uh, dimensions of uh, diversity, mindset get in our way. So through motivational speaking, through coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching, through workshops, providing solutions like that. Um, I help organizations in the areas of authenticity, leadership, diversity, equity, inclusion, and personal power. And I love the, the overlap because we're both in the world of leadership and communication. Um, let's see. And I'm just getting a note here that says, looks like our stream is not showing up on LinkedIn. That's awesome. This is likely a known issue with LinkedIn that they're working to fix. Try ending this broadcast and creating a new one or just remove the destination from the broadcast and then re-add it. Okay. Well, let's see. If I'm, I don't know, Dr. James, do we go with it and just record it and post the, the recording afterward? Go for it. Go for it. There's we're recording. All right. We're recording this. So everybody out there, you know, you get to see behind the curtain, the little green man, as it were, in Oz. And, you know, we're having the show. This is this is totally un unplugged, unfiltered. This is the reality of working in the uh, in the digital world of today. Sometimes Absolutely. things work, sometimes it doesn't. And we're going to share all of this. Well, the cat didn't go across the screen. The little child didn't come from the background screaming. So we're okay. Not yet. I don't have a cat. I don't know if you've got a cat, if we're going to suddenly see the tail kind of moving its way across. Uh, it's, it's early enough in the day that my five-year-old's not going to start pounding on the on the door hearing me because he's pretty sure that my only real job is as his social secretary, mm. considering he was basically born with a camera in his face every 20 minutes. Hey, I had a grandma. He just assumes that I'm just holding down the fort until he can come and entertain the world. And he's obsessed with my microphone and, and all truth. So, uh, but I think we're safe. He's, he's not home from school yet. So we should be good to go. Um, so, you know, but Dr. James and I are in the same world of leadership and communication. And I like that our, if you think about our Venn diagrams, as it were, uh, that's where we overlap. And you have the expertise more in the DEI field. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to give a little bit about your background in there. Sure. Um, sure. And, and mine is more from the perspective as a linguist. And there are you know, we are both also sharing the former, um, current and or former academic 
backgrounds that we have. You know, we both did PhDs in this world. So we both had to do a lot of research, a lot of publication, a lot of hardcore study and, and not just, you know, blog posts and pontifications and those kinds of things, which I've learned to be good at at the same time. But, you know, we've got the numbers, we've got the stats, we've got the data behind it. And so we'll bring in a little bit of that. But uh, and this is a good opportunity for us both to model the notion of taking that egghead expertise, that expertise that uh, can turn into experts curse, but learn how to take it and translate it so that normal people can understand what we're talking about. And, and we hope that everybody out there takes it, uh, a little bit of mental note on that front too, um, and watches as we try to practice what we preach on that front. So, uh, you know, with that, Dr. James, give a little bit of background. What was your academic background and where does, where not just a uh, generically speaking, but where does authenticity actually come as a really specific um, focus of research and, and and specific professional expertise? Sure. I did my undergrad in English, my master's in journalism, and decided over a period of time to pursue this construct called authenticity. And I, I did because doing my workshops on presentation skills, diversity, equity, inclusion, personal power, someone would invariably say, I'm one way at home and I'm one way at work. And I struggled with why couldn't they be whole all the time? That was my introduction to pursuing my research on authenticity at work. And through that discovery, I realized, yeah, I did a lot of the going along to get along, the collusive behaviors, the, uh, the covering. I did things that I thought were psychological, psychologically safe. Mm -hmm. And I realized through my research, and even back then, I wasn't always true to myself. I didn't always share or stick to my values and beliefs. And it's hard. It is something that we always wonder because you can't just it's not so much that everybody has skeletons in the closet, but you don't necessarily want to put everything in a greenhouse either, where everybody sees everything all at once. I mean, you go on a first date, you don't want to <laughs> dump everything about your entire history. My, my cousin is in jail. You know, he's been there for 32 years. He was my best friend growing up. <laughs> right. Here's all the trouble we used to get into. And here's why I realized that my last six ex-girlfriends, you know, hated my guts and what I did wrong. But let me, and I've learned from it. That's, like there's there's a time and a place to divulge certain sure. things and you do need to test and see what's appropriate where you know I, I think the the you know kidding aside the key word that my my radar latched onto when you were talking is the notion of whole being your whole self and you know the we talk about integrity and integrity of identity. And what a lot of people don't realize is that the word integrity, the root of it. And so now I'm going to go into my little geek moment, but uh, you know, the, the root of the word integrity is the same as the root of the word integer, which is the notion of a whole number, right? Not fractions, not decimals, but being whole. Sure. And, but it's a question of in any given moment, how much can you share? So the, um, where we want to make sure that people are clear and the, the metaphor that I like to use, and I've written about it in, in my book and speaking to influence and talked about it with a lot of conferences and a lot of clients is uh, what I like to call the prismatic voice. Mm. And if you think about it in the same way that you've, we've seen those little crystal-y doodads hanging from kitchen windows or in the car. And when the sunshine hits it, the rainbow comes out the other side. You see it on the floor or the wall or something like that. And in the same way, we are that white light that has all of those colors inside of it. And it's just a matter of the, the prism is the context that you're in the moment, right? Are you in a board meeting? Are you on Zoom? Are you interviewing for something? What is that context? And in that moment, which of those colors needs to shine most brightly for you to have the effect that you want, for you to get the results that you want. Because when I think about myself, you know, I mentioned, I got a five-year-old. I don't talk to him like this. Why? Because it wouldn't work. And it's not that I'm being inauthentic, but let's call that my mommy voice. And we'll call my mommy voice my, my blue. Actually, we'll call that my orange because look, we're here in our blue today. So we'll call this version, this professional semi-professorial, semi-coach, you know, speaker mode, that's going to be my blue. 
And it's not that either one of those is the real me versus the fake me. I'm not being authentic in one of those contexts and not in the other. It's just that I know that here, you don't want to hear my mommy. I mean, you might find it <laughs> for really entertaining for 30 seconds, but it's not going to give the credibility I need. You don't need to see that part of me. He does. So it's okay to turn, if you think about the DJ's mixing board, you know, in some context, you're going to turn one up. I mean, you, you can, you can do the, the turntable better than I can probably. That's, I'm not going to pretend I have any skill in that area whatsoever. You can't do it worse than I can do it. But, you know, to just decide in this context, which part of me needs to shine more brightly and which one would I tone down? Look, you're dressed to the nines today. I've got my sort of business casual style going on. I also have black tie and I've also got gym shorts in my, in my wardrobe, but they're not appropriate for here. I need to let this side of me come through. And I think when people realize that they can pick and choose in that way and still be authentic because they're making an authentic, contextually intelligent choice, they don't have to show the whole rainbow all at once. If so, we, you know, if that's- we are thought. making that choice contextually, because sometimes yes. the research suggests we have bias processing Interesting. Where, Tell me about that. Because we see something a certain way, we make the assumption that that's going to be the outcome. Mm. So we base it on our, how we see the world. Yes. But how we see the world, what's an ace nine quote? We don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. So who's to say the way we see the world all the time is exactly the way it is. So sure. maybe in this instance, you don't have to change the story you're about to share or what you about to what you were about to divulge about your weekend or your experience with the client. Yes. Yes. Making those contextually smart choices is important. And I find that, uh, you know, we all have our conditioning. We all have our filters. We all have whatever, whether it's our birth order, whether it's our gender, whether it's our, our role in the organization, whether it's our industry, uh, you know, the past boss that we had, the past clients that we had, the, you know, there's lots of stuff that, that conditions us to be a little extra sensitive on certain, certain ways. And sometimes that helps us. And sometimes it, it, it holds us back. Like I had an ex-boyfriend who did this, so I'm not gonna let any other boy. Okay. Well, but maybe this guy's actually just trying to be nice. Maybe he's not doing it with ulterior motives, right? We have trust issues on a personal professional level, all that kind of stuff. Um, so just learning to recognize how to make those choices in a way that is safe, but also productive and not getting in our own way, as you mentioned, is your expertise. So Tell me Dr. A little bit. Dr. Laura, and that's hard. Yes. It's hard because you, you never know for sure. I'm reminded when, when my, my first real job back in the 80s, and I was promoted into a position where I reported directly into the director of customer service, total quality management, and so forth. One afternoon, we had a meeting, executive floor. That's where we sat. They were in executive sure. wing, I was, my cubicle was out front, but yep. <laughs> anyway, yep. we, I met with her and her boss and we were talking about a project. Before we got into the project, we were idle talk. He's a New York Giants fan. I'm a <laughs> Philadelphia Eagles fan. I told him before I uh, came into corporate, I tried out for the Giants, like for real, real, tell me about that. And then he said, we play each other this week. Let's make a bet. I'm not a betting person. I'm certainly not making your money, but how about this? If the Eagles win, you wash my car. If the Giants win, I wash your car. <laughs> we shook hands. Uh, no problem. We get to, back to my boss's office, and she sits me down, and how dare you? He's a senior VP. How dare you talk about washing his car or him washing your car? You don't have those kinds of, like, we're just talking. No, you don't have those conversations with people at his level. Not to that point where you're washing cars like your boys, your friends. Wow. Really? Mm. Okay. Lesson learned. And how did that go over? Not well. For me, not well. Mm. But it was, it was, it was leveling. It was table setting. For me, it was the GPS of what I could say and what I could not say. I could not get that comfortable, mm. that friendly, or build that level of affinity with someone at his level. And I, I did question the race aspect of it because he's a white man, I'm a black guy, and she's a white woman. I just thought it was a, a, a class, a level, 
a positional uh, conversation. So uh, now, of course, there's one super important detail that you have left out. Who won? <laughs> oh, I, have, I don't even remember. Uh, you I, don't remember who washed whose car? No, there was no car wash. That, no that, car that, wash. that was over. <laughs> Got that, it. that was over. Okay. So that was a, a handshake in name only, so to speak. Well, my director threw a wrench into that. That's not happening. No, this is corporate. No. Right. You do that with your friends. Right. But it left an indelible mark around conversations that I could have with upper management, senior management. How much of me could I share? Sure. Sure. And that, you know, that is something where a hierarchy is now becoming more and more of a question in today's uh, workplace. You know, the notion that all people are created equal as it were, but nevertheless, there is a question of, of respect uh, for authority and, and those kinds of things. So where does that experience overlap with the notion of authenticity? Would it have been, if you were to go back and, and now you were, I'm going to call it your unfiltered authentic. Uh, so just the, the reflex autopilot mode, this is my comfort default setting went in this direction. If you had redirected, not made that suggestion, just, you know, if he suggested the bet in the first place and you just said five bucks or a cup of coffee or a, you know, donation to the charity of the other person's choice, perhaps, um, <laughs> would that have been less authentic? Yes, because okay. it would not have been my knee jerk immediate response. I, I should have said, I, I bet you that maybe right in your office on Monday morning to get on your case about the Eagles winning that type of, of, of request. Now that I think about all my years in corporate, that's, that's something that I should have kept to myself because we, we weren't at that level of kinship. Okay. And that speaks to me being less authentic, but choosing to do so because is what I desire or what I want to perhaps avoid. I never know the answer. We don't ever know the answer for sure, but we have to use our, our judgment and act accordingly. Right, right. And you know, and I think this is some place where maybe we can discuss re- defining that notion, going back to the, the the prismatic voice piece, maybe it's that a little less of the, you know, hanging out with my boys, uh, you know, assumption of familiarity when you were new and a lot younger and whatever else, maybe that was, that's your default setting is your green and that's your preferred way, but in a new context that it would have been better to go a little bit yellow. You still have the yellow, it's still your yellow and it's going to be your version of yellow, but to play the diplomacy to act to, to, I guess I would encourage people to think about that as just learning to strengthen your yellow, where your default and your preferred may be the green to not, and you could tell me, I don't want to step on anybody's toes or, or contradict or whatever, um, but that it's, I feel like it's more empowering for me in my situations if I can look at it and say, okay, I'm not being inauthentic by going yellow when I prefer green, but I'm just stepping out of my comfort zone. Because that's, I think one of the challenges is that if we associate authenticity with comfort zone, then we can never grow. Because by definition, learning to do anything new is going to be stepping outside of the comfort zone, but is it inauthentic? I mean, I remember when I first was learning how to, how to dance, I took swing lessons for a while. I love <laughs> doing swing, uh, big band music, a lot of fun, but man, did I have two left feet at best. And was it inauthentic? Cause I was God awful at it. No, I don't think so. But, you know, learning to just embrace the, okay, I'm still working on that learning curve. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Dr. Lower, that's why for me, my research suggested that authenticity is not a matter of either or, either authentic or inauthentic. Right. It's a matter of degrees, more or less. I'm more authentic in this situation or less authentic. And that myth around you are authentic consistently. It's fluid, we believe. You may be authentic in that moment, but it does not suggest that you're authentic all the time. Uh, something like jewelry or a painting or a rug, that's authentic. It's one of a kind. It's not changing. Mm. Every day we get a chance to become. 
to become again, to be again. And depending on the situations, I believe we choose to be more or less unless we are obnoxiously authentic. And now we're getting into what's called the impropriety threshold where your level of authenticity is egregious, narcissistic, is not accepted by the organization's or culture's core values. Yes. And so there's about 18 things that you just said in there talking about the <laughs> cultural values of the organization, because that's an important thing to recognize, right? When there's a fit versus not a fit. And um, you know, like six other things just went into my brain. I'm gonna have to write them down so I can bring them back. But let's dive into that one for the moment, because sure. sometimes you do have to make a choice and to say that there's, you know, we're, I like that you mentioned it's not an either or, it's a to what degree. And first of all, filters, I think, are something that we all need to know how to use. There's a time and a place. Diplomacy, by definition, means not just blurting out whatever you want to say, you know, whether it's your client or it's your employee or it's your boss or it's your mother or whoever it is, they say something that you inherently disagree with, looking at them square in the eye and saying, that is the stupidest thing I ever heard. <laughs> that may be your most uh, you know, what you're feeling most authentically in the moment, but it may not be in your best interest to just verbally smack them across the face with that. But I don't think it's being inauthentic to take a deep breath, repress that inherently authentic urge to just put them in their place and prove that you're right or whatever it is. And say, you know what? Okay. You catch more flies with honey than vinegar. So how am I going to frame this in a way that's not going to make them hang up the phone on me or just turn this, in, you know, devolve into a shouting match. I, I think it's important to recognize that as being tact by itself means not going with your preferred instinct and urge in the moment for the greater good for your own purposes as well in the long run. I mean, does talk to me about that. And if, if you do, especially if it's giving feedback up, as you know, we call that truth to power. Mm -hmm. And speaking truth to power is a risk. Yes. Something negatively could happen, even though the organization says we want your true authentic self. Mm. If you agree with us and many who have spoken truth to power have said, A, I'm not going to do it again. Or B, I can <laughs> sleep at night. Or C, I've learned to live with the wound that I got for speaking my speaking my truth. Right. And my research suggested that being authentic <laughs> sometimes leads to enhanced job satisfaction, enhanced job performance, uh, better communication. And that happens, the research suggests, when there are great relationships with peers, with management, or the corporate culture's values is in, are in line with yours. Yes. So, okay, that brings us back to the values piece as far as corporate um, or, or organizational culture. And how do you, how would you suggest people go about trying to identify, okay, I'm in this organization and the, it seems like people prefer this. It's not my preferred whatever. At what point, can, how do you encourage people to either decide that it's worth it to me to learn to 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 speak the language of this particular group because I love everything else about it, or I believe in the mission, or I just don't want to change jobs. I want to make it work, um, and maybe help them to see your way. You know, when is it time to push versus pull? Versus, you know, say I, this is not a good fit. I, I really would be happier somewhere else. And if you are going to learn to stay, how do you do it without telling yourself? I'll stay, but I, I can't be myself. That yeah. black and white, all or none piece. How do, how do you traverse that? Part of that, we start with this. I hate this term, but exists. There's the in group and the out group. Sure. I think everyone should be included. That's number mm -hmm. one. Number two, I, though have, I have to recognize who those people are that have the combination, the code to the culture. Yes. And once I acknowledge and recognize that, then <laughs> it will be incumbent upon me to have conversations with them, informal, offline, whether it's lunch or after work. But if they know the combination, if they know the language and you want to learn it, 
attempt to have those conversations and hope that you get the intel. If you don't, you have to really watch and observe what's happening around you. Listen for what's said, listen for what's not said. Listen to who says it, how often, who says it second. You're really in meetings, doing a real discovery, needs assessment um, experience to collect that data. And you'll know you need it. You'll need it when, if every day feels like you're walking into a headwind mm. where you're doing the right thing, but it's not advancing you and advancing your career where others, it feels like a tailwind to them where they're moving along quickly. And it's because in their mind, I'm working hard. I'm smart. I'm doing the right thing. Well, sometimes people in, I believe people in underrepresented groups, whether mm. it's gender related, sexual orientation related, um, age related, mm. it feels like walking into a headwind every day. You can't, can't see it. You just, you just, you feel it. Yeah. And leadership will say, there's no headwind. We mm -hmm. all, we all can progress evenly if we do our work, communicate well in our authentic. <laughs> right, right. Our authentic selves. So if there is that sense of, I feel a headwind, leadership would deny that it exists, that look, they've got the policies on paper, we're good. You know, we've put these certain practices into place. So we've taken care of that. There shouldn't be headwind, but somebody else is saying, I, I still feel like I'm pushing against it. Yeah. What, what do we do? You gave a great answer earlier in terms of how much of me can I continue to pour into a situation that's not working. That was my story. I did 14 years in corporate, hmm. even achieved the level of vice president. And I still felt that there was a degree of, of, of holding him back or not creating opportunities that others have that could not be as creative and innovative and as disruptive and had to, this is how we do it. So after 14 years and achieving level of VP, I still said there was more. And that's when I left corporate to start my own business. And I'm not encouraging everyone else to do that. But if your situation is not going to change, you have to change how you show up in that situation. And I know that from a psychological safety standpoint, I feel a lot more confident as an entrepreneur, business owner, than I did when I was in corporate at times, feeling insecure, feeling like a victim, not sharing my truth, people pleasing, because I wanted to get this elusive promotion, then the next promotion, then the next promotion, I'm chasing promotions. And that's not a, um, a, a positive thing to do. You should chase being the best possible you and all those other achievements will follow you. Now you said something and it's, I'm going to, I'm going to take the challenge and, and uh, you know, get comfortable with the discomfort. I'm going to lean into a little bit here. So um, we're going to open up a little sensitivity, you know, topics of sorts. You mentioned, you <laughs> use the phrase. And so if, if I'm misinterpreting, then I want you to correct it, but sure. you use the phrase feeling like a victim. Mm -hmm. And so that as phrased, lends to one of or both of two different possibilities where when you describe those experiences those feelings were there times when looking back objectively like oh no that was definite you know villain victim kind of dynamics versus there were times i felt like it and but i, I don't think it was necessarily that explicit or intentional but i felt it and maybe at the time i would have used that word but it wasn't technically you know how much of it was interpreted versus actual well, there were times certainly where I uh, contributed to my shortcomings. Oh, wait, let me get, wait, 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 wait. You, you get in your own way sometimes? Because I've never <laughs> done that. I've never <laughs> opened my mouth and stuck my foot in. I have never, and I'm sure anybody else out there has never had the experience of being their own worst enemy, getting in their own way. So did I hear that correctly, Dr. James? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. My whole bubble just got burst. <laughs> You're not, per you, were, you were not perfect. You are now. Okay, we fixed the problem. Now life makes more sense again. Go on, continue with your no, story. Part of, part of being becoming an expert in, in your field is having lived it yes. falling down you know scrape your knees but yeah th there were times the people pleasing you know putting other people in front of needs in front of my own needs 
Uh, so part, so yes, we contribute to it. And then other times when we feel that unfathomable negative feeling of here we go again, and they're not giving me answers. I'm working hard. I'm coming in early. I'm staying late. I'm in yeah. grad school. And you don't have a viable, measurable answer for me for why I'm not climbing. Yeah. Yeah. And yep. okay, okay. It, it has to be me. It's like going into your boss's office confused and leaving more confused. Mm. Especially when he or she or they say, just keep doing what you're doing. Keep, mm. What am I doing is not working. Yeah. And you're not and, giving me any answers and, as to why. And, and sitting on my stuff, not truly saying, I believe this is happening because of, because if I do, my perception is they're going to say I'm playing a card. Right. An age card, right. a race card, an education right. card. Right. So I, I sit on it. Yes. And, and walk around confused and then begin to pull back and say, I'm not giving you all of me because you're not giving right. me all of you. Right. So you're, pay, you're paying me 100% and you're getting 75% of me. Right. And you're telling me you want more of me, but you really don't. It's an oxymoron. You really don't. Yeah. Yeah. At least I don't believe you do. I had a flashback when you used earlier the phrase, you know, well, because we're doing it this way because that's the way we've always done it. That... Oh my gosh, that's when I left corporate America, which was, I was like 20 minutes out of college when I left corporate America because <laughs> I got into this company that was v of a cultural background, both, you know, from, from the parent organization and, you know, where it was from geographically and whatnot, but also just uh, industry wise, it was like, oh no, change is the enemy. Mm. We must maintain mm. yes. status quo. And if there was a hierarchy to the extent that, even if there was a typo or a grammatical error of some sort, if that original sentence had come from the powers that be, no one would change it because no one's going to tell that person there's a typo. I'm going, but the company looks stupid by publishing something that has a typo in it where anybody who reads is going to go, why is there a typo in that material? Because no one's going to tell the boss that there were, and I just thought, okay, there's, yeah, no, I just, I can't be part of this. I absolutely viscerally cannot be part of an organization. And that was just one example, but mm -hmm. it was, yeah, that was definitely a cultural non-fit and I could have turned. And of course, that's not something that has a, you know, an ism attached to it sure. or a card sure. to be played. So, you know, it's a very small example, but that was indicative to me of a, I will not be happy. And of course, because it was representative of many of those same kinds of things, I went, I'm going to lose my mind or I'm going to shoot my mouth off and get fired. Like I can only swallow that kind of answer. That just is not who I am. I can't handle no. it. So I needed to leave uh, because it would not have allowed me to be authentic in, in any way. Um, aside from the fact that I really hated what they paid me to do anyway, it was just really boring work. But, you know, so to be able to make those choices, when is it just not a cultural fit and it's time to go versus, you know, academia. Look, we both were, we, we moved up the ranks. You know, we both were faculty at uh, different universities at different places, but I also knew, you know, my status, I could rate, and especially as adjunct faculty, I was put in my place more than once and overtly, like sometimes passive aggressively, but with no veiled intention whatsoever. It's like, you know, it, it, you don't have, the, it's not your place. I was actually told literally once, it's not your place to make that kind of suggestion. I went, okay. And this is from a department in a university, which the research that they wrote about was all about the evils of hierarchy and, and of cultural dominance and repression and, and, you know, how that was all the evil. I'm going, do you not see where you're at? like, what? You just wrote a book this thick about why, you know, this group suppresses that group and represses and oppresses and all the other presses. And you just told me it's not my place to, to make, make, the, to make that make bet with that senior VP. <laughs> it's not my, what? Well, I mean, I didn't even challenge her. It's not like I, you know, challenged her to an arm wrestling or a, a ice bucket challenge or, or something else that's super buddy, buddy. It was literally just a professional suggestion regarding, you know, something or other that it was, perfectly within the realms of what I would have considered normal and uh, what, what you contextually did, appropriate. What you did ties into being more authentic at the time because authenticity is around self-knowledge, 
self-awareness and self-regulation. So are we living in accordance with our values, our beliefs, and do we act, do we act accordingly? Do we speak and communicate accordingly? And you said in that situation, this, this isn't for me. Mm-mm. This is this goes against how I'm wired. Right. I have to go to a place where I can be more effective, I can be more open, be vulnerable, be more, more authentic. Right. And those two examples I gave are, of course, quite uh expansive in, in their difference, right? The one I was entry level and it was just the whole nature of the way the company did kind of everything. I just went, I don't belong here in any way, shape or form. Later on, it was, I was under the impression that this was part of my job. You did want me to yeah. do these kinds of things and it would be completely within normal, uh, whatever, to to make a suggestion along these lines uh, or to make such a request and to be turned around and, in, you know, no diplomacy whatsoever to be told, yeah. get in your place. It is not your place. Know your place. I'm like, did we just go back to 1920? Mm. Like, woman, mm. know your. And it was mm. another woman, so mm. I can't even say it was a sexist mm. or whatever else. But it was like, know your place. And I went, oh. You just okay. said something that I find very intriguing, and that okay. is, it was a woman who modeled that behavior. Trust me, when I, I was in corporate, I had more than just majority members make it challenging for me to advance. Hmm. So sometimes your greatest challenge is the person. When you say like majority you. members, you say, you mean white men? Yes. Okay. Yes. Sometimes your greatest challenge is the person who looks like you. Hmm. Because what do you think that is? Yeah, give me the why. That's I, I, tie it in, I tie it to or attach it to scarcity thinking compared to abundance thinking. Yes. Abundance, come on, I'm gonna help you up. I'm gonna empower, I'm gonna use my power to spread my power, to empower. Scarcity, I got my power, I'm gonna let you take it away from me. Nope, 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 right. nope. It took right. me too long to get this power, so nope, nope. Right. I'm gonna it's take a finite you down. I'm the one. Get back in your place, I'm the one. Yes, yes. And it, it's interesting, because on the one hand, this was a female dominant, um, department overall. There were far more women than men. So I don't think that was particularly the case here. Mm -hmm. um, but it definitely, you know, with, I, I can't, there's probably a phrase for it when it comes to other ethnic groups, when it comes to gender, often what you've described, it can be referred to as the queen bee syndrome, mm -hmm. that there's only room for one woman at the top and she broke through and is now, has learned to make her place in the world of men. And she doesn't want another woman to come in and screw things up. And, you know, she's worked too hard to, to, get ensconced and doesn't want somebody else to dethrone her, so to speak. So is there something, a similar analogy in yeah. other cultures? As a, as a result of that experience, that tokenism. Your, your experience, the person could then decide to, I'm going to cover part of who I am because leadership views who I am as too egregious, too loud, too yes. flamboyant, but we begin to cover and covering my research suggests that there are four ways that we cover and we being people typically in the less dominant group or the subordinate group, uh, people who are underrepresented, there is appearance covering where you don't dress or appear the way you would typically appear because mm -hmm. of your perceived beliefs. There is affiliation covering where you hide the f affiliations you're a part of because you perceive them to be not accepted. There is the advocacy, advocacy covering where you don't let others know who you advocate for because you perceive it to be not in the line with the corporate values. And there's the association covering and that's avoiding associating in public mm. with people who you perceive what begin to create negative stereotypes, assumptions, so you cover. Yes. Yeah. So covering is, is by definition, if I'm understanding you correctly, is as just masking or not letting anybody know about some aspect of you or, or hiding that part actively, which is, I think is different. And I think it's important distinction from the, uh, the notion of the prismatic voice. To me, it's not about hiding your orange, you know, it's just recognizing in it, that's different. When it gets to that extreme, you're in covering. And that's not what the prismatic voice model is trying to promote. Yeah. It may be time, it, 
how much you talk about your love of the Lord or, you know, about whatever it is, it may be, you know, inappropriate to express it quite that much. Is it inappropriate to tell people that you go to church at all? That's different, right? Are you, are you hiding something? So I, I think to be able to recognize when is it a healthy degree of choice to just say, you know what, this is not the right place at the moment. You know, it's, in my best interest right now, just to highlight this other part of me, because it's more relevant to this group. It's just, it's more appropriate at the moment, as opposed to, I better not tell them this. That's a different internal monologue. Right? When you say, I probably shouldn't tell them. And that's, that's again, th this is very challenging. I, I think about the professional coach, tennis, hockey, football, basketball, baseball, you name it. And he or she or they are interviewed after the game, the match, a tough loss where a couple of their players made bonehead plays. So the coach is asked, well, coach, you know, Joe and, and, and Jane and Jennifer and, and Richard, they dropped the ball. They threw the interception. They let the ball go between their legs. How do you feel about that? Well, I just have to put them in a better position to make plays. Um, I have to go back and look at the videos. Um, I believe that we can do a better job, and it starts with me. No, the person <laughs> dropped the ball. They dropped the ball. They struck out. It went, but say it. Say your truth. They don't. And, oh, and is they, that being inauthentic, or is or that less, just where's less, the line? Less. And they say the same thing about players and politicians, and you know, we want their truth. Do you really? Mm. And, Dr. Lord, years ago, after the Miami, Miami Heat lost in the championship to the Dallas Mavericks, someone asked LeBron James, how does he feel about losing and how does he feel about the fans? He said, well, I still got paid and I'm going home to my mansion. I don't have a nine to five job. You know, I have my family. They'll be next season and, you know, and I'm going to enjoy the rest of my life. That's what most athletes want to say, but you can't say that because the fans believe that you play for them or yeah. for the city. They don't see the job aspect. And he got crushed in the media for saying the unsaid. Mm. Yeah. And is it, we have to go back to where is the, where does diplomacy and empathy yeah. come into play? Yeah. Because it's, you know, it may have been what he was generally feeling and there's something to be said for that kind of honesty, but <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, now I'm in twice. Well, that's interesting. All right. <laughs> Welcome to the world. Oh, there you go. Welcome to the world of uh, LinkedIn and, and virtual. I don't know what happened. We just had a nice little detour into the twilight zone. Uh, you know, so I hope if nothing else, diversity and, and authenticity aside, everybody out there takes solace in knowing that when stuff goes wrong for you, it's not just you. Okay. I, teach people how to do this kind of broadcast, this kind of live stream, this kind of whatever for a living, webinars, et cetera. You see everything that happened here today. It just happens. And when it does, you just roll with it. So we're back. And so with that, let me summarize it, send it back to you, Dr. James. Yes. What advice do you have to help people start to work on expanding that sense of authenticity, being more of their true self, but in a way that is still not coming anywhere close to that inappropriate level, that threshold number three, and with reasonable calculations with regard to the context and how to take those steps. Would you rather I speak for the individual contributor or for the leaders or both? As the spirit moves you. For the individual contributors, we have to uh, begin to change the story in our head. We have to, again, start thinking more from an abundance mindset, not a scarcity mindset. We have to be more communicative, more open, more vulnerable, and more purposeful and wise. Don't just throw in the towel because it didn't work the very first mm -hmm. time. Uh, build those connections. I would even say diversify your mentoring team. We all have mentors, and sometimes all of our mentors look just like us or sound like mm. us or our age or have similar experiences. You begin to grow and learn more when you have a, a diverse group of, of mentors, of advocates. And, and they, what they will do is help you like a, uh, 
a golfer has a caddy. The caddy pulls out the club to give to the golfer, saying maybe this one or this one lets him or her know the win factor, but he or she is helping guide. But there's a lot of different clubs in that bag, the three to five to seven to nine. They're not using the same club every time. Well, mentors, diverse group of mentors or, or a, a support group will help you be more diverse in your thinking and know how to act accordingly or at least give you possibilities and suggestions and not the same narrative. And for both groups, the individual contributor and leadership, yes. that, that get rid of the fear factor. Leaders have to lose sight of if I am more vulnerable, if I am more open, I'll lose control of the team. I'll, I'll, I'll lose control of the direction of the organization. Uh, you, you said several times, being comfortable with being uncomfortable, not projecting discomfort if right. you have that conversation, not projecting a negative outcome or forecasting failure. It's, it's moving in. It's feeling the fear and moving in. And it's understanding that we live in a society that's still struggling with this construct, still not sharing their truths and it being allowed and accepted because it's sensational. It's a hot topic. Yeah. But it, it could be very demonstrative to the workplace, to individual achievement, performance, communication, and um, set job satisfaction. Yeah. Yes. With that, oh my goodness, that was a packed hour with a lot of surprise technological snafus in it. But you know what? We rolled with it. We stuck with it. We're going to make sure everybody else gets access to see the recording afterwards. I have learned so much from you. I love the threshold. I'm going to get you to like write that out for me and we're going to we're going to spread that around cuz I think there's incredible uh freedom in understanding those parameters that it's when you understand oh that's you put it in that sense then it makes sense. Then I understand where my safety is, I understand where my flexibility is, I understand yeah. where good healthy risks are but giving myself some responsibility in that too. And you know nothing is done in a vacuum. And when you realize what the context is, those kinds of structures, I think that your three thresholds and the prismatic voice, when they come together, there's massive power to be had there. Like us. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And we seem to, every time we jump on, I swear we do not plan this. We always seem to be in the same color scheme. Uh, it is, there, there's something mm -hmm. going on there. So love it. All right. On that note, thank you everybody so much for joining us today. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to Dr. James, reach out to me on LinkedIn, on, on uh, YouTube, on wherever it is. Would love to hear your feedback, anything that you've got. And if you'd like us to cover some other topics in the world of leadership, communication, diversity, language, you pick it. We would love to hear from you. Thank you for joining us today. Look forward to hearing from you in the future. Wishing you all incredible success. Thank you, Dr. James. Take care.